So with ocean acidification, you get uh, some harm that can come to the oysters. They don't grow as well, especially in their juvenile stage that can cause massive mortality rates. This Oregon Sea Grant funded research is essentially looking at uh, analyzing whether implementing shell bags will improve the health of the oysters. In water, those shells will dissolve slowly over time. That releases calcium and carbonate, and so that carbonate essentially buffers the water, and it allows the, the shells to grow a little better. The shells are essentially acting a little bit like an antacid in your stomach. You know, you take, you know, take a Tums or put an Alka-Seltzer in a, in a glass of water and what does it do? It fizzes in your stomach. It, you know, counteracts that acid. And so that's kind of what these, these shells are doing. So approximately one year ago, we took those oysters from the hatchery and then put them on varying amounts of empty shell to examine whether or not the growth rates will be different depending on how much shell material is there. Uh, so these are dead oyster shells, so they're just the shells, no meat, they're not alive. So we've got essentially three stacks high, two stacks high, and one stack high of the bags. Um, and so we want to know, you know, how many shell bags do we really need to get enough of a buffering effect, you know, enough dissolution uh, as that acidified water comes into the bay. You know, how much is enough to actually buffer these bags because economically, you know, you have to pay to get these bags, you know, how many, how many do you actually need in order to make it enough to actually work. More oysters means more dissolution, which means more buffering, um, but if, you know, you get enough buffering from two bags high as opposed to three bags high, you're going to choose the two bags high. So we're trying to figure out which one actually works the best. Over the past year, Sophie and the rest of the research team has been staining the oysters with manganese and a fluorescent stain called calcium to measure the growth of the oysters. So the oysters are taken off of those experimental conditions, put into buckets where the stains are included or incorporated into the shell for a few hours, and then they're placed back out into their respective uh, treatments. And that process more or less happened every two weeks for a year. Now we can actually take a cross-section of the shell as you would with a tree ring and look at those growth, growth lines uh, as they've grown over time in the past year. On the screen here you can see some of these fluorescent marks. Those represent different points in time, different sample periods where Sophie actually uh, immersed the oysters as they were growing in this stain. And then what Sophie and Alyssa and Adam are doing is essentially looking at how, what the chemistry was like during these periods in the water and what the chemistry in the shell was like and then seeing if we can establish that relationship between them. So we're going to measure uranium and calcium in the oyster shells and we're going to use this as kind of a fingerprint for pH. So the, the ratio of uranium to calcium will actually change in the shells depending on the acidity of the environment. We're going to use the uranium-calcium ratios to compare um, between the treatments that we have out in the field. So actually see if um, those bags of shells are effectively buffering against local acidity. But we want to see is whether or not we've actually changed the chemistry, right? And so once we develop this, this calibration or this relationship between the shell chemistry and the water chemistry, then we can see if we've actually changed that because of the shells.